Lord. All right, welcome to the Berean Bible Fellowship. Today is May 15th. Um, as always, we like to open up with a word of prayer or praise. Does anybody have any words of praise or anything that's going on in their life right now? Yeah. Any, uh, any uh, prayer requests? <laughs> I do have prayer requests for Nina's brother. She's not here today because um, her brother is going on a cross-country backpacking trip okay. with his friends. And so she went to church with him and her siblings to pray for him before he left and everything. So she just said if you can keep him in prayer. Oh, we sure he will. next week and he'll be gone for three weeks. Okay. All right. What's his name? Jonathan. Jonathan. Okay. Does anybody have any, any anyone have anything else? Uh, I'd like you to keep Raquel and I in prayer. As I said, uh, we finally found out the, the how we could contact the owner for the one building that we've been uh, looking at for the last year or so. So, uh, if it's God's will, uh, hopefully we'll be able to work something out. Amen. Uh, does anybody else? Uh, Bernardo's uh, health. Uh, glad to see him here. Uh, just pray for him to be feeling better. Pray for everybody. All family, friends, all y'all. You know, seven days a week. Hopefully we all are blessed to see you tomorrow. So, uh, pray for everybody. Okay. All right. So if that's it, let's go ahead and bow our heads and we'll open up in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to Stop and just give praise to your name, Father. Father, we want to thank you for the grace that you've given unto us. We want to thank you for the guidance and leadership that you've given us throughout the week. Father, we pray that our, our hearts and minds be open to the word that you've prepared for us today. Father, help us to learn from it and help us to apply it into our lives each and every day. And Father, we, we pray for those who aren't here today. We pray that those who are able to watch on, on the internet, that they'll be blessed with the message. Father, we just ask in, in your holy name, Father, that you just bless this congregation. In all things we ask, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 Lord, please fix this list that I have. <laughs> um, Today we're going to be continuing on with our with our study, and we're going to be going into the age of conscious. Now, last week we went over the age of innocence, and we ended up right with Adam and Eve being expelled from the garden because of uh, because they sinned, because they broke God's uh, God's instruction, and they ate from the tree. So as I said, we always start off each, each new section and we talk about the new beginning. The new beginning was Adam and Eve are now outside of the garden and they are now, they are now absent of any rules or law. The, the, law, the only rule that, they, that God had basically given them was don't eat of the tree. And now they're outside the garden. God has put uh, uh, angels guarding the Garden of Eden so they cannot enter back in. And no one can enter in. So now man is, man is, in, is in what's called the age of conscience. Where he has to decide to choose good or evil. Before, he only, he only knew good. Now he's going to be given the, ch the chance of choosing good and evil, making, making up within his own mind what is right. And we're going to see where that leads man. So, at the beginning of the age of conscience, man has fallen from grace. Man now knows the difference of good and evil. And Adam and Eve are expelled from the garden. Now man is ruled by, ruled by no particular law. Okay? Now, the one thing that God has set a standard for in the garden, He set a standard for sacrifice. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned, that they went and they took fig leaves and they sold them together to cover themselves up, to try to make themselves acceptable to God. And remember, God rejects that. God goes out and He slays an animal. And He makes coats for them. Now, when God slays an animal, what does that... What, 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 what does that fulfill 
about one of the one of the requirements of God. Shedding blood. The shedding of blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Now, what remission of sin? Many people are mistaken when they hear remission of sin. Is remi is remission of sin? Does that mean forgiveness for sin? No. Because the, because the blood of an animal can never pay for sin. Okay. Remission is more like under the under the, under atonement. Substitute. Not a su well, substitute. But what it's doing, it's causing a delay in judgment. God is saying, okay, I'm not going to judge this right now. He's, he's delaying judgment on it. And, and when during the later we're going to study the law, we'll see that, that God institutes animal sacrifice again. And again, it's, ju it's just atonement, just a delay in judgment. So Adam and Eve's sin was not paid for here. It was just delayed, the judgment on it was delayed. But God sets up a standard, and He's He's telling them, okay, and when you sacrifice an animal, an animal's blood must be shed, okay. And where where Adam and Eve sowing fig leaves together was a shadow of of works of man doing the work. The shedding of an animal, an innocent animal, is a picture of grace, something that man does not does not deserve. Man does not work for it. There's nothing he's done for it. Okay, so we come upon Cain and Abel. Now, Cain and Abel were Adam and Eve's first two children. Cain was born first, then Abel. And we're going to see that there's going to be a foreshadowing of Christ in the story of, Ad, of, of Cain and Abel. Now, Abel was a shepherd. Now, what do we know what a shepherd is? A shepherd is a, a herder of animals, a caretaker of animals. Jesus Christ is said to be our shepherd. <laughs> Calls us animals, right? <laughs> Probably rightfully so. <laughs> but he is he is our shepherd. Because what does the shepherd do? The shepherd leads his flock. He keeps them safe. And he leads them. So Abel was a shepherd. Cain was a farmer. He was a tiller, a tiller of the ground. Now, when time came that they were to give sacrifice. Abel, who was a shepherd, brought the, the firstling of his flock. Now, do we know what the word firstling means? Perfect. The best. That's what I thought, and, and uh, I was kind of going with that, but then I stopped and said, you know what, I said, let me look, let me look that up, just to, just to make sure. Perfect. It means the firstborn. Oh. The firstborn of his flock. That, that's what he bought. Because we must remember, this is, this is a foreshadowing of Christ. Okay, so he brought the firstling of his flock as instructed. Cain brings forth the fruit of the ground. And God rejects Cain's offer. Now, in Genesis 4, 4 through 5, it says, Abel, he also brought of the firstling of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had no respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Now what does it mean he was wroth? It means he was angry. Mad. He was mad because God rejected his, his offering because he worked hard for it. But God rejected it. And I found this entertaining. It said his countenance fell. Do we know what that means? That means he twisted his face up. <laughs> you ever see when, uh, when, you, when you catch one of your kids doing something, or you tell them not to do something, what do they do? They twist their face all up. <laughs> so so that, that's, what ha that's what happened with Cain when God rejected his offer. So he's like, what? Well, what do you mean you rejected him all? He, he twisted his face up. Okay? So... Cain ends up rising up against Abel, and he slays him. He kills his brother. Because God sits there and tells him, he says that, he, and he asks him, he says, he says, why are you angry? He says, don't you know if you do well that you'll be accepted? In other words, he was telling him, if you follow, if you follow my instructions, don't you know that you will do well? So follow my instructions. 
But Cain didn't follow his instructions and he was angry. And as I said, he rose up against his brother. And God, like any good father, he sits there and he asks Cain a question. He says, Cain, where is thy brother? God knows God ans God asks questions that he knows the answer to already. Okay? Just like when Adam and Eve were in the garden and he asked Adam, Adam, where are you? <laughs> and Adam was hiding. God knew what had happened. God knew it before it happened. So he asked Abel, where is your, bro where is your brother? Excuse me, he asked Cain, where is your brother? And he says, am I my brother's keeper? So here Cain had decided in his own mind that it was okay to kill his brother. That it was okay to bring an unfit sacrifice in front of God. When God was trying to give him a picture of grace, was trying to give him a picture of what was needed for salvation, that this was not something that he could do up upon his, his own, that only through the sac only through great the grace of God, the free gift of God, can we be acceptable to God. So what ends up happening with Cain? God ends up banishing him, and he tell he cast Cain out, and Cain is uh, troubled. And he says, anybody who, who sees me will kill me. So God puts a mark on it. And he says, anyone who sees this mark, no one will kill No one will kill you. Okay? How about? Yes. What is the mark? Like, what's, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't specify. It just says that it put a mark on him. That, uh, that people knew that they were not to touch him. Yes. Can you, um, can you um, trick Abel? He didn't trick Abel. He just he, he brought him out in the field and they were talking and he, he took he he took something and he killed him. Did didn't say exactly what he used, but uh, he didn't he didn't really trick him. He just killed him. Why were why was Cain um, afraid that people would kill him? Was it because he killed his brother? Yes, yes. And, and this is and this is the first uh, recorded and first murder that we have in the Bible. Okay. And again, the story of Cain and Abel foreshadows two different paths to salvation. Cain's sacrifice of fruit of his labor represents salvation by works that God doesn't respect. Abel's sacrifice of the firstling of his flock is representative of the sacrifice of the Messiah, the Son of God, the only begotten. He who is without sin, who would become sin. The continuation of the age of conscious, conscious began with Adam and Eve expulsion from the garden. And it ended with Noah and the flood, 1,656 years later. And in the sixth chapter of, uh, of the book of Genesis, it starts off with stating the status of mankind. Let's go ahead and turn to Genesis 6, 1, 1 through 7. Genesis 6, 1, 7, it says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all, which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that, the, that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of his thoughts, of his heart, was only evil continually. And it, and it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, 
and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Now many Bible scholars believe that the sons of God that are referred to here, he's referring to the Nephilim. The Nephilim were angels that came down on earth and mated with human women. And also what they did is they taught men arts that they didn't know. They taught them the art of weaponry, how to make uh, weapons out of metal. They taught women how to use uh, makeup to be seductive. They also taught them many sexual improprieties. Okay? So all these things started to infect man, and man became wicked. And as it says here, his, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And this is what happens when man is left to his own devices. And this is what the age of conscience is about. That man, when left to choose between righteous and evil, guess what? He's going to choose evil. And this is what the age of conscience is about. The fact that man will choose evil. We look at Sodom and Gomorrah, where the whole town had become infected with wickedness and sexual impropriety. We look at the time of Noah. We look at now. Now, men are, men are now sitting there saying, instead of looking to God for guidance, they're looking to what is right in their own mind. How many times have you heard that term lately? How many times have you heard man sit there and say, well, don't judge me. Don't, don't tell me what I should be doing. I should be doing what's ever right within whatever I think is right. You do what you think is right. I do what I think is right. So man is deciding within his own mind what is right. God is being pushed out of our, of our, of our lives, of our government, of, and out of our decision making. Each day that we go along, we hear another and another thing that pushes us further and further away from our decisions of deciding for God. We're at a point right now where if you bring God up, people are offended. If you bring, I, I just, I recently had a, a co-worker at my job who was talking about me when uh, I wasn't there, <laughs> as we say, talking behind the one's back. And she sat there and stated, well, at least, at least you're not talking about God all the time like Julius is at work. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I wear I wear that as a badge of honor. I wear that as a badge of honor. Nor do I worry about them firing me or anything else. Because you know what? I know God has got my back. The day that God doesn't want me at Elmcrest anymore, He'll He'll assign me someplace else. So I'm not worried about that. But. When, my, when the day comes that I die, if, if I die before the, before the rapture comes, when people stand up at my funeral, I hope they sit there and say, the only thing I remember about Julius is God was on his lips every time I, every time I talk to him. Yes. Amen? Amen. So, so man has sat there and, and now pushed God out of his life, now and back then. And it became so wicked that God saw it necessary to destroy man because he says he repented that he that he created them. Now remember there's two types of repent. Did it mean that God was sorry that he that he created them? Do we think that's what it meant? No. No, that's not what it meant. It meant that he changed directions. He turned from. He started he was going in this direction when he created them. He now was going in this direction because he's going to destroy them. <clears throat> so, so when we get to when we get to the age of Moses and we see how wicked things have become, we now understand that man has now failed the trial of the age of consciousness. Because remember, each one of these dispensations is a trial for man. And what is a trial? What is the trial to show man in each age? It's to show man. That God, that he needs a savior, that he can't do it on his own. So first we had the age of innocence, 
where man did not know evil. He only knew what was good and only had one choice, only had one way to disobey God. And when given that one choice, when given that one way, man chose that one way. Now we go to the age of consciousness where man is left to his own devices to decide in his mind what is right and what is wrong. And where did we find ourselves? We find ourselves that man has become, the whole world has been infested and is now evil and wicked and has turned away from God and turned away from God's guidance to the point where God says only Noah was righteous. Only Noah and his family. Everybody else on the earth was wicked and needed to be destroyed. And also, the Nephilim had infected the human race. The Savior needed a clean bloodline to come through. A human bloodline. Because Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. Not part angel. So Noah's bloodline was the only bloodline that was pure and uninfected by angelic uh, influence. So that was another reason that God destroyed the earth in order to protect the bloodline that Jesus Christ would come through. So Noah is found to be righteous by God because of his belief. And in Genesis 6-8, it says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So, the conditions that existed before the flood have a special significance for Jesus Christ himself prophesied about the future. In Matthew 24, 37 through 39, it says, but as of the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So what is he saying there? He's saying that we went, during those hundred years that Noah was building this ark, Noah was also preaching to the people. And he was telling them, God is going to destroy this earth. Water is going to come from the sky. And just as Ashley said earlier, they thought Noah was a nut. What is rain? We don't know what rain is. At that time, water came up from the, it came up from the ground, is dew. And the earth was, was water. Is that like when you're fire in the morning? Excuse me? Is that like a car in the yes. morning? Yes. Yes. So sometimes in the summertime when you wake up and there's a dew, it's, it's wet. That's how the earth was replenished. Back then there was a there was a covering over the earth that, that gave that replenishing and it came up from the earth. Um, so it, it had never rained before. So him telling them that water was going to come out of the sky was just something totally foreign to them. I mean, I don't even know what even to compare it to right now. It would be like saying, okay, uh, tomorrow you're going to wake up and fire is going to be coming down from the sky. And you do, yeah, okay, right. <laughs> I've never seen that before. So back then, for those hundred years, Noah's preaching and, and telling them what's going to come upon them, telling them to change their ways. Is it any different than now? We sit there and we are telling people that Jesus Christ is coming back. We have so many signs right now that are going that are going on where Christ said it's like it's like a uh, it's like a woman in labor pains as they get closer and closer, the closer it's coming to the Lord's coming. You see, there's more and more earthquakes. You have pestilence. You have all kind of diseases right now. You got the Zika virus. You have uh, what was that other one that they had you know, years ago? They had another uh, Ebola. Ebola, the Ebola virus. You've got more and more prevalence of cancer. You've got all kind of illnesses. They're getting more and more prevalent as we go along. You have the AIDS virus. Okay? You have, you have it says here that they were, they were, they were eating and drinking and, mar and giving, giving in marriage. When they say giving in marriage, it doesn't mean they were getting married. 
it means that they were doing things outside of marriage. Okay? God's not talking about things that are, that are holy here that they were doing. Okay? They were living their own lives. They were deciding <coughs> within their own minds what is right. This is, just as now we have our, our president just sent out letters to each and every school telling them that, that the children will be, can, have to be allowed to use whatever bathroom that they identify with. Yes, a letter was sent out Friday by President Obama to all to all the schools, all public schools. Kids can go into the yes. They can go into the boys' bathroom, girls' bathroom. Yes, kids kids can go in any bathroom they want now, whichever bathroom they identify with. That's crazy. Okay. Got suspended for going in the boys' bathroom. So we now, so we now are at the place where they're just making making decisions on whatever they whatever they think is right. God is out of the picture. And if you try to bring God in the picture, they'll sue you. Okay? So this is where God said that we would be at the end at the end days, at the second coming. All this is to let us know that we can't do it on our own. We can't do it on our own conscience. I always thought, uh, when you talk about your conscience, it, it, it was always funny. I always think about that cartoon when you were younger. We had the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other one. And the devil's sitting there telling you, okay, let's go do this. We'll have fun. And then the angels say, no, don't do that. Just let's you know, do what your parents are saying or whatever. You, you've got that conflict inside you. You guys ever have that conflict inside you when you're in school or something? And you, and you, you know that you want to do something, but you know that it's not right. And you think about it and you feel like it's a battle going on inside. Well, trust me, you have that as an adult too. Okay? You have to sit there and listen to that spirit within you, the Holy Spirit, that is trying to guide you in the direction that God wants you to go into. But the age of conscience comes to an end with God's judgment upon mankind. After a hundred years of building an ark, Noah and his family enter the ark and are saved from the judgment by water. Now, after the flood... A couple of things happened with Noah. In Genesis 8.20, it says, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offering on the altar. And again, this was a foreshadowing. This was a foreshadowing of Christ. In Genesis 8.21-22, through 22, God made a promise to Noah. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither, neither will I again smite any more any, every living thing as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and heat. In the summer and winter, in the day and night, shall not cease. So God is saying that He won't He won't destroy all mankind again. And as long as the seasons and man remains that He won't do this. God then makes a decree in Genesis 9, 2 and 3. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fish of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. This is the first point where God says it's okay for man to eat meat. Before this point, man only ate herbs. Okay, so now God is telling him here, he says animals will live in fear of you, and you can, you can now hunt them and eat them. Okay? In Genesis 9, 11 through 17, God makes a covenant. Now, we talked about a covenant earlier, right? What is a covenant? Covenant. My class. I know. <laughs> we I forgot that quick. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm promise. gonna give a promise. Okay. Oh, okay. I was gonna give you another word. It's an agreement. A promise or an agreement. Okay? 
So God here makes a covenant. And this covenant, you guys have all seen before. Okay? And when I finish reading this, uh, I want to see which one of the kids can, te can tell me what this covenant is. He says, And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is a token of the covenant, which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth, that a bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud. And I will look upon it, and I, I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is a token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. So, just the kids, what is the covenant or what is the mark of the covenant? What is it? Covenant. No. <laughs> okay. What is it? God said that when the clouds come in the in the in the in the uh, sky, something's gonna come. What is it? Okay. What comes what, when it rains? What do you see in the sky when it stops? A rainbow. A rainbow. A rainbow. That's a that's God's promise. So that's what God. That's what He's talking about here. God is saying that. That rainbow is, is a mark of his agreement with man that he won't destroy the earth again by a flood. So, so the beginning of the age of consciousness, again, it started with a new beginning for Adam and Eve. After they had been expelled from the Garden of Eden, from the beginning, we experienced the first murder with Cain slaying Abel. In this age of conscience, man is given the opportunity to choose good over evil. Man fails miserably, and the world becomes so corrupt that God repents for man's creation. God's ju God judges mankind and destroys all living life on the earth except eight souls and the animals that are saved by the ark. In Genesis 9-6, God says, Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God man was made. This is the first command for man to oversee the actions of other men. This is where we move into the next dispensation. Next week, we will move into the age of government. And this last verse that I read here is basically saying that if a, if a man kill another man, he is to pay with it by his life. And that's the first place where God instructs, um, instructs man to oversee other men. And I said that leads us into the age of government. Okay? All right, do we have any questions? Yes. <laughs> you have a question, Jerome? I just call it a comment. What's that? Noah wasn't black. Noah was an albino, I guess. Black? Uh, well, he had a chicken on that boat, and he took it. <laughs> Alrighty. <laughs> with that, uh, let us close up. Let, let, us, let us close up in prayer. Everybody, bow your heads. <coughs> bow your heads. Show respect. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the message today. Father, take us home safely today. Guide us throughout the week. Father, help our actions uplift and glorify your name. Help us to be work, uh, ambassadors for Christ. Help us spread your gospel throughout the week and bring us back safely here on Thursday. Father, in all these things we, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior and we say, Amen. Amen. Amen.